Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone around the world. You're welcome to another event in the African Literature Association Lecture Series for the 2021-22 academic year. My name is Akinya Deshokan. I teach comparative literature and cinema and media studies at Indiana University in Bloomington, Indiana. And it's been my pleasure to moderate this series in collaboration with my colleagues in the Executive Council of the Association, beginning with James McCorkle of William and Robert College in Geneva, New York. The series began last year as an initiative suggested by the immediate past president, Gilman Negash of Ohio University, Ohio State University, and has continued to receive the support of the Executive Council this year, particularly of the current president, Mohammed Kamara of Washington and Lee University, who is a co-organizer of the series with Matt Brown of the University of Wisconsin-Madison. So uh, I, while listing the co-organizers of this series, I mentioned Matt Brown's name last, contrary to my usual practice of mentioning it first. This is because he's our feature speaker today, discussing his new book, Indirect Subjects, Nollywood's Local Address. And I thought that it would be necessary to underscore that happy coincidence. As a collaborative under undertaking, this series is also a form of service to our community. And so when a member of the executive council takes on the additional task of presenting her or his work, the service commitment dovetails with a kind of privilege that Tejumola Olaniyo often spoke of as the characteristic mode through which service based on trust manifests itself. So in other words, it's, uh, it's a privilege to be asked to serve. So thank you, Matt. Matthew Brown is assistant professor of African Cultural Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. His research relies on a range of cultural forms, including television, film, video, literary fiction, popular music, and popular fiction. Currently, he's working on two monographs, a cultural history of media literacy in Africa, and a study of contemporary representations of global poverty. Brown's work has appeared in the Journal of African Cultural Studies, the Journal of African Cinemas, Black Camera, the Cambridge Journal of Postcolonial Literary Inquiry, and the Global South. As I noted earlier, his book, Indirect Subjects, Nollywood Local Address, published by Duke University Press in 2021, <clears throat> excuse me, is the focus of today's lecture. The book is a product of original research written with very sensitive attention to the overlapping specialized roles that particularly screen media have played in the emergence of Nigeria as a socio-economic force in the world. As far as I can tell, it is also a report of Brown's immersion in Nigerian and African lives in the past decade and a half. Considering that that process of immersion began with his drama, with his writing on the drama of Walesho Yinka, Matt Brown in this book deepened and broadened those ex earlier exertions in coming up with a modal agreement walk through in a diachronic manner. Since he is better placed than anyone to explain how, the, how he developed this argument, I'll just let him take it over from here. So over to you, Matt. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Adeshokan for that <laughs> very generous introduction. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you might be. Um, you know, this is such a great honor and such a great privilege, um, you know, to be able to speak um, to the African Literature Association about my book, um, you know, but also to sort of, you know, feel um, the confidence of the association behind me. Um, in addition to Akim, I would like to thank uh, the ALA president, uh, Mohamed Kamara, for his brilliant and steadfast guidance during these difficult times. My sincerest apologies. What I have said several, what I have said several times is that um, I'm running both the um, live streaming software as well as my own presentation software, and it seems to have uh, crashed my computer. So, let me. Let me uh, say a few words of thanks very quickly, um, not as many as I had prepared, but thanks for your patience and understanding, number one. Um, 
I guess this is a good opportunity for me to say that one of the things I love about the African Literature Association is its welcoming environment. Um, it's always felt like a very inspirational place uh, to share my work and find interlocutors for my work. Um, and I'm relying on your gracious and welcoming presence today. Um, once again, I apologize for these delays. Um, uh, thanks to Professor Adeshokan. Thanks to uh, everyone on the EC. Uh, it's a real privilege to serve the African Literature Association. Uh, and nothing that gets done uh, by the EC is an individual effort. Um, and it's been such a pleasure to serve as part of that group uh, for the time that I have. I'm going to um, share my screen once more. Um, hopefully this will work well. Um, Uh, Professor Adesh will come. Please feel free to contact me any way you want if uh, there uh, come to be any more uh, AV problems. So thanks again, everyone. Uh, my, presentation, my presentation today will unpack what I acknowledge is the rather opaque title of my book. Um, I will also cover some of my key arguments and a few case studies that illustrate those arguments. Um, and I'll discuss, you know, sort of why I chose to write the kind of book that I did. So let me begin with the title. Uh, this book opens with the following lines. Make sure I can display them to you. The title of this book is A Prism. By focusing the light of Nigerian screen media on it, three observable wavelengths disperse, illuminating Nollywood, Nigeria's commercial film industry in different but complementary ways. Here, for an image of a television screen, I've used a photo from the promotional material supplied by the Ibadan office of the Nigerian Television Authority, the NTA, for its 20th anniversary celebration in 1979. That is the Ibadan office's 20th anniversary celebration. Later, I will discuss how it came to be um, that in 1979, state television in Ibadan was 20 years old, while the nation state of Nigeria was but 19 years old. Um, I will also discuss... <laughs> um, I will also discuss uh, the reason that television matters for my book. Um, the NTA Ibadan was originally called Western Nigeria Television, hence the WNTV uh, on this TV screen that you see here. And it, pri it prided itself on addressing its audience through a pedagogical modality, as you can see. It is this positioning of television in relation to its audience that I aim to explain in my book. Moreover, I'm interested in the relationship between television and commercial film in Nigeria and that relationship hinges, I argue, on the way that they both address themselves to their local audience. And so that's the reason for the subtitle of my book, Nollywood's Local Address. Um, yes, that subtitle is a play on words. I'm not searching for the location of Nollywood, where it might receive a package, for instance. Um, rather, I'm interested in how Nollywood addresses itself to what it considers its local audience. But let us return to the first part of my title. If indirect subjects is a prism, then it has several meanings that can be disaggregated from one another, but also collapse into one another. As the opening paragraph of the book continues, at one end of the spectrum, indirect subjects are ancillary thematic concerns, the subjects of narrative exposition and contemplation that operate at a slight remove from the primary subjects of screen media texts. In other words, Stories such as films and television programs often have direct subjects, the things they are clearly about, and indirect subjects, the things they are also about, but not primarily or not directly. I hope that is pretty straightforward. Continuing, at the other end of the spectrum, indirect subjects are imagined spectators, members of a theoretical public addressed and positioned by certain examples of screen media in certain ways. They are invited, by Nollywood and some of its antecedents, such as state television and colonial cinema, to participate in the process of subject formation, of being conscious, perceiving agents who are nevertheless subject to a wide range of material and ideological limits on perception, but they are invited to participate indirectly, both as central to and held at arm's length from the political and economic processes that shape the modern world. The second wavelength requires a great deal more unpacking, which I will get to in a moment, in the meantime, in the middle of the spectrum, uh, I, as I write in the book, um, there is a wavelength that's more clearly visible to the naked eye. 
It initiates the method by which this book gains access to the extreme ends of the spectrum and sees Nollywood as part of a larger cultural and historical formation. In film theory terms, it is known as free indirect subjectivity. So we have three different iterations of the phrasing indirect subjects, narrative subjects or topics, social subjects or people subjected to certain forms of power and addressed uh, by screen media, and indirect subjectivity, a formal convention employed in various audiovisual texts. In the book, I begin by showing how free indirect subjectivity works, first in a television soap opera from the early 1990s called Checkmate, and second in a seminal Nollywood film, Living in Bondage. Today, I'll be begin by explaining indirect social subjects. That is what I mean when I argue that Nollywood imagines its audience as a collective of individuals who are subjected to a form of power that operates indirectly. And then I'll get to some of the other meanings of indirect subjects. Now, as you can probably tell these concepts, well, they might be clear to me in my mind. Uh, to explain them, I, I often find myself resorting to unfortunately cumbersome and abstract language. So one of the first things I decided to do for the book was to invent a neologism to help me circumvent some of that cumbersome language. Indirect social subjects are products of what I have coined as periliberalism. It's a form of power and governmentality aligned with liberalism, but not identical with it. Periliberalism is also not interchangeable with neoliberalism, which we can discuss a little bit later if um, you're interested. Periliberalism describes a relationship with liberalism. It's both within and without. You know, the same way that peri-urban describes zones of a city that lie outside of the city proper, but nevertheless contribute substantially to um, and constitute the city, peri-liberalism describes a state of political and economic subjections that's not simply about being peripheral to the liberal world order, not at all. It's about being, um, in here I'm quoting from my book, fundamentally and indispensably constitutive of the liberal world order, precisely by being held at arm's length from it, unquote. The primary argument of my book is that Nollywood participates in a political economic project of peri-liberalism, not necessarily by design or by choice, but rather because of history or how Nollywood came to be and how previous forms of screen media have already constituted a relationship between screen and audience. The history of screen media I'm interested in is a deep one that includes colonial cinema, and therefore it spans the late 19th century through the 21st. It is also a history that because it involves formal colonialism, independence and post-colonial politics, many members of the African Literature Association will know very well. Um, nevertheless, there are certain moments in that history and ways of interpreting them that I think are worth retelling now. The key reason that the history of peri-liberalism I think is well known to many of us is that it's actually been studied by eminent scholars even if they've used a different terminology. One of those scholars is Mahmoud Mamdani, uh, many of us are familiar with his work in Citizen and Subject, where he explains the roots and effects of indirect rule. Uh, but perhaps few of us, uh, fewer of us are familiar with his later research on the proto-architect of indirect rule, Henry Maine. Um, Maine is also the direct subject of um, Karuna Mantena's book, uh, Alibis of Empire, which is a relatively recent contribution to a growing field of that that um, you know, political theorists are calling liberal imperialism studies. The question for students of liberal imperialism is how and why some of the most egalitarian rhetoric in the history of Europe, at least, that is liberal political philosophy, arose at the same time as and participated in some of the most iniquitous practices in the history of the world, that is the transatlantic slave trade and colonialism. Reading Mamdani and Montana together, I show that indirect rule, as theorized by Maine and implemented in Nigeria by Frederick Lugard, and the ways it was extended through colonial film practices um, was key to solving the contradiction between liberalism and imperialism at the time. While Maine was writing at the end of the 19th century, Lugard, the infamous uh, first governor general of amalgamated colonial Nigeria, put his ideas to work in the years during and just after World War I. He established native authorities and carved out zones of the colony that were politically, economically, conceptually, and even geographically separated from the various capitals and port cities where colonial administrations collaborated with their metropolitan counterparts. In short, indirect rule creates spaces where colonial subjects had reduced access to the liberal world order, whether in terms of political benefits or economic opportunities. So how did this resolve the contradictions of liberal imperialism? Montana calls indirect rule an alibi of empire because it was a way for the British to claim not to be at the scene of the crime. 
Whereas in the 19th century, British colonialism inspired several uprisings and, and revolts from Jamaica to India, indirect rule was designed to supposedly return political and cultural agency to colonized subjects, particularly in Africa. By governing themselves according to their own cultural heritage and in their own languages, Africans would be less likely to oppose the colonial project or so the thinking went. This was supposed to reduce the imperial domination of colonized subjects while also reinforcing basic principles of liberalism. During the interwar years, British liberals gained political confidence by reassuring themselves that they were knowledgeable and respectful, even protective of the cultural specificities of various African societies. They understood their stance as a form of egalitarianism, an equal if separate kind of reverence for African lives. Of course, their separation of African lives from the liberal world system was not egalitarian at all. It also reinforced another foundational aspect of liberalism, of course, capitalism, the economic system that liberal political philosophy arose to accommodate and elaborate. In another recent contribution to liberal imperialism studies, uh, Onur Ulash Inje writes that colonial capitalism was a form of what Marx calls uh, primitive accumulation. Um, as many of you know, primitive in this sense means primary, initial, the rough and uncapitalist methods of jumpstarting a process of capital accumulation. One way of thinking about colonialism, therefore, is as a process not of direct capitalist exploitation, but a way of securing zones of eventual exploitation, holdings that through all manner of political, military, and other non-economic means could be made to serve the inevitable growth-seeking tendencies of capitalism. Thus, by circumscribing zones where liberal political values and capital investment were not applied, British liberals of the early 20th century reinforced the foundations of liberalism. They created a system where global liberalism could thrive, not by gobbling up every corner of the earth, but rather by holding certain parts of the earth at arm's length from liberalism's processes and benefits. These places therefore became central to the enduring viability of liberalism, but once again, not by being kept outside of it. In the end, the primary relationship that many colonial, colonized people have had with liberalism is as indirect subjects. The question that remains is how and why I would argue that this process of indirect subjection is still at work and why I would claim that Nollywood participates in it. Let's begin with colonial cinema, which is part of a genealogy of screen media conventions that I want to link to Nollywood. The first chapter of my book begins with a story about a film expedition undertaken by two brothers from London, uh, Norman and Vincent Greville in 1922. The footage they captured uh, was made into a series of short silent films for the 1924 Empire exhibition at Wembley. Later, some of that footage was re-edited into a colonial cinema film called Black Cotton in 1929. Each iteration of the footage uh, attracted important observations, you know, that are sort of captured in the historical record, um, two of which that I will note today. First, British liberals who reviewed the films highlighted the idea that they showcased, quote, the real African life. Um, it may be difficult to see here, but here's a, um, a page, you know, for my archival research from a trade journal called West Africa. This was published in 1924. Um, there's an unnamed, a pseudonymous uh, writer um, who has a regular column in West Africa. He calls himself Spotted Dog, um, and his column is called A Coaster's London Log. That is referring to the West African coast. Um, and in Spotted Dog's reviews of um, these short silent films that were uh, being shown at the 1924 Empire Exhibition, um, uh, Spotted Dog says that those films show the real African life. This sentimentality, this sentiment, was part of a trend characteristic of the new liberalism of the interwar years, in which well-educated British observers eschewed the language of primitivism and savagery, uh, savagery that their forebears used, and instead they value signaled about their deep knowledge of and reverence for the ways of, um, for African ways of life. And it, in some sense, liberalism sounds, it sounds very familiar, right? Um, liberalism then and liberalism now. Um, the films and their critical reception seem to have emphasized the importance of sort of leaving Africans alone to practice their various customs rather than transforming them into black Britons as previous liberals uh, wanted to do. Excuse me. Paradoxically, um, the point of the empire exhibition was to foster trade between the colonies and the metropole. Uh, since the conservative government in London at the time was becoming more economically protectionist with regard to Europe and America. 
The colonial desire for African resources was thus framed somewhat differently than it had been in the past. Those resources remained central to the global liberal capitalist project, but it was decided that Africans need not, indeed should not, directly engage with the liberal world order. Instead, they should remain true to their African heritage while a handful of select merchants engaged in liberal capitalism. The second important observation about the Greville footage came after the footage was re-edited and taken to Africa um, for exhibition. And Julian Huxley was an evolutionary biologist who was asked to take it with him. That is, you know, um, the, the new, newly re-edited film. Uh, under a title, it was in one of those films was titled Cotton Growing in Nigeria. Um, and he traveled to East Africa in 1929 uh, as an education consultant and showed the films to um, uh, students in different kinds of schools across East Africa. The film elicited a number of fascinating responses from students, which they provided in mandatory essays on the screening events. In Uganda, a 20 year old medical student named S.N. Lameka wrote the following. The method of growth in co uh, cotton in Nigeria in the first stage is almost alike of ours in this country. This is what he says after seeing the film. But from harvest to made up lint or even to a garment in the hands of the natives themselves became gradually different when compared to ours. They themselves dress in their own European made looking clothes manufactured every inch in their own land with their own hands and brain. While the cotton industry in Uganda is grown by natives themselves and shipped for foreigners and that is all. Indeed, the cotton export trade was more robust in Uganda than Nigeria, that's the export trade during the interwar years. But this has less to do with the failure of, quote, their own hands and brain, as Lameka puts it, um, than with the exploitative structures of the colonial economy. Essentially, the British did everything they could to make northern Nigeria, where the cotton footage was captured by the Greville brothers, into a node of the global textile trade, except they did everything they could except pay reasonable prices for a Nigerian produced fabric and cotton, a fact that is well documented by historians. This film about cotton in Nigeria, however, featured intertitles um, like the following. In spite of the great import of cheap European cloth, the native weaving industry continues to flourish. The impression the film seems to be designed to give, which um, also seems to have worked in the case of Lameka, was that Nigerians chose not to participate in global capitalism for their own reasons. Again, however, it was the fact that British liberals acted illiberally when it came to trade with Nigerians that held them at arm's length from liberal capitalism. Perhaps in today's discussion, I could speak more about the differences between Nigerian and Ugandan cotton markets if necessary. For now, what's important is that these films fostered the idea that some Africans chose not to participate in liberal capitalism because of their own African cultural reasons which showed how self-reliant they could be. Whereas in actual fact, they were rarely given such a choice. This is how periliberalism works, not just as a political economic system, but as a discourse and a potential subjectivity about being outside of the liberal world system while simultaneously being absolutely central to its function. Now, it's also pretty well established that when television broadcasting was established in Africa, it inherited its social position from colonial cinema, you know, like it or not, where colonial cinema was designed to incorporate Africans into the modern liberal world order in certain ways, television was established by national governments to modernize Africans, you know, in other ways. The message may not have, the messages may have been very different, but the purpose of both screen media was to position Africans with respect to the modern world. Uh, Fre Frederick Cooper, historian, uh, many of us know, describes the early post-colonial nation state, uh, you know, the government, the state, as a gatekeeper state, because it controlled the gate between the economic potential of the liberal world order and the various needs and interests of post-colonial citizens, right, situating itself between what was going on out there and what people needed in here. In Nigeria, state television played a very key role in that process. State television was first established in Nigeria in 1959 in the now defunct Western region by Obafemi Awolowo's action group political party. The action group had already established an imi uh, imitation of colonial cinema that they called government free cinema in 1956. And then in 1958, after a dispute in the Western region parliament, Awolowo sought radio airtime to address his constituents and he was denied by the colonial government. So his party spent the next year building a television station, which began broadcasting in October 1959, a year before independence from colonial rule. 
In my book, I focus on the careers of men like Adebayo Faletti and Shegun Olushola to show that Western region television and later the nationalized Nigerian television authority were keen on fostering development in many of the same modalities as government free cinema and colonial cinema. In particular, I look closely at The Village Headmaster, the longest running television serial in Nigeria, which was created by Shegun Olushola. And I hope some of you have, have seen it. You know, Perhaps some of you have seen more episodes of it than I, because um, not very many, at least in my experience, remain. I argue um, in, you know, in the book that the character of the village headmaster, this is the third one here, this is Justice Esiri, um, the great actor who went on to um, you know, a, a fantastic career in Hollywood um, and who played the, the third village headmaster, um, Cosmos um, Ali, Adegbe Ad Ali. Um, I argue that this character, not just the one that Justice Esiri played, but his, uh, you know, um, the previous incarnations as well. In all these different iterations over the year, you know, they were designed to elicit spectator identification, such that audiences were invited to see the process of development through the ideas uh, of the village headmaster and therefore through the eyes of the state. Though some analysis of free indirect subjectivity, that's that film convention I was talking about, feature in my reading of uh, colonial cinema, my analysis of the village headmaster shows how free and direct subjectivity can help elucidate screen media's modes of address. There are moments in this series, and I'm not gonna play this clip. Um, I hope that some others will work later, but there are moments in the series, and this is a still image of such a moment, where in visual terms, spectators are invited to look at the village headmaster as if he's presented in the third person, right? As if there's sort of like a, an audio visual narrator saying, here is uh, Ali. Meanwhile, spectators are invited to hear or to think along with the headmaster on the audio track. In this case, there's music on the audio track that aligns with this letter that he's reading, right? And so we get a sense of like, we're hearing his own thoughts inside his own head as he's reading this letter. And it's this ambiguity between seeing him in the third person, but hearing his sort of first person experience of reading this letter that constitutes free indirect subjectivity. It's analogous, um, you know, for all of the uh, literature scholars amongst us, uh, what we call free and direct discourse in literary studies. This ambiguous slippage between narrative voices often takes place in key moments of the text that indicate one way in which we might understand that text. In the case of the village headmaster, we can understand the text as an invitation to sympathize with the developmentalist state sort of embodied here as it struggles over and over against all manner of recalcitrant local forces to bring development to the nation in carefully planned packets. Now, in the book, after I illustrate how Nigerian state television inherited its social position from colonial cinema and how it imagined its local audience and invited them to attend to the story, I then go on to show how several early examples from uh, the commercial video film industry, that's it, that is Nollywood proper, right, were related to state television and extended some of the formal conventions of state television. And perhaps this is the most significant and even contentious argument at the center of my book. Why would the popular commercial film industry, which arose in the informal economic sector, imagine and address its audience in ways similar to state television? What my close reading of many different examples focused on their use of free and direct subjectivity suggests is that the periliberal logic behind state television is more than just bureaucratic or even political. Periliberalism is the governing logic of a great deal of screen media in Nigeria, precisely because it is the governing logic of contemporary capitalism as it sort of operates in and around Nigeria and other parts of the formerly colonized world. The subjectivity of indirection is woven into the fabric of Nigerian screen media culture. And I hope that by providing a few examples drawn from four different chapters of the book, uh, I can sort of illustrate these points. So let's see if this clip works. Cuts off just a little bit there. Of course, he says, admiring my wife is not a crime. All right. So this, you know, sort of very um, classic old Nollywood film, Games Women Play. Um, 
which you know came out in 2005, is doing a couple of things here, right? So free and direct subjectivity or attention to free and direct subjectivity helps here to, to help us realize that the film is sort of asking us to identify with Emma's perspective. Emma, the woman who lives in this house, um, and while this man claims to be her husband, um, this house is actually um, another man's house uh, who Emma's also married to. Um, uh, in fact, she thought that this man, uh, you know, pictured here by, uh, played here by Bob Manuel Udoku, um, was dead. Um, but it turns out that he wasn't. It's a very melodramatic and interesting and convoluted plot. But here he is back and so Emma actually has two husbands. And this beautiful house that she lives in, um, uh, which is owned, you know, um, uh, by her other husband and that she's taking care of so attentively, um, it sort of signals, you know, uh, uh, the good life, right? Of Emma's sort of um, achieving, you know, all the sort of markers of a good life. She has a perfect husband. She has a beautiful home. She has two wonderful kids. Um, what's happening in this scene is that, you know, her second husband here is actually threatening the order of that beautiful life. And we are invited to see him through Emma's eyes, right? So when she sees his feet and it, the camera pans up to his face, uh, that's a point of view shot clearly from Emma's point of view, but also the sound of that synthesized guitar sound making what we call pinch harmonics. Um, that sound plays several times in the film, but it only plays when Emma's marriage is threatened in certain ways. You know, it's a long film with a lot of parts, but in those moments when her perfect uh, marriage is threatened, that sound plays. So it's, there's a sense in which that sound is part of a subjectivity that is aligned with Emma. What is Emma's major dilemma here? Well, like I said, she has a perfect husband. He's devoted, he's wealthy, he's loving, but it's not clear that she deserves him, right? Because she sort of has this other husband and this other sort of mess in her life that needs to be cleaned up. If she could get herself set straight, and if she could truly have the ideal family, the film seems to suggest a, a, an ideal family that's you know a very ideologically constructed one, monogamous, um, neo-local, right? They live in this house together. They're not really sort of threatened by outside forces. And if she could have this perfect man, this man who can afford this beautiful house, um, Emma doesn't work, um, who is essentially therefore a breadwinner, a man who can win enough bread for her, then she would achieve a kind of fantasy ideal life. I argue that the fantasy that Emma desires is less about the kind of man in it than about the structural conditions that could produce that kind of man, that kind of family, that kind of economic situation. Um, to continue to try and illustrate this point, I'm gonna to turn to another clip and hopefully this one plays as well. I don't mean to hurt you. But your people like that monster. But your people like that monster. They are wicked. They are wicked. What have they done to me? What haven't they done to me? What haven't I done to make them happy? So help. I have even so What more can I do? What more can I do? I will always love you, my dear. I will always love you, my dear. Mom and Anne. Mom and Anne. They don't understand that I love you too. But I've got to let you go. I've got to let you go. I've got to let you go. Don't hurt the darling boy. Don't hurt the darling boy. I mean it. Don't hurt him. So I really hope that this is coming through. I can't be quite sure of that now. Um, I rehearsed this and it worked when I did. Um, you know, if not Ada here, um, who's not who's not the woman pictured in this um, um, in this portrait. Um, in fact, it's it's the best friend of the woman pictured here. This is from Checkmate, the NTA soap opera that um, you know, according to some observers, was perhaps the most you know popular soap opera of a kind of golden age of Nigerian television in the late 80s and early 90s. Um, the character Ada, like Emma before, has a perfect husband, but laying in that hospital bed, she's saying that she's going to have to leave him. Um, 
in that moment, you know, we are once again sort of seeing the um, action of the program as if from a sort of third person perspective provided by an audiovisual narrator of some kind. Uh, but the sound again is um, Ada's voice inside her own head, right? We're being invited to kind of hear her thoughts along with her. And Duka, her husband, who's um, laying beside her, can't hear those thoughts, but we, the spectators, can. So once again, it's a moment of free and direct subjectivity, whereas this ambiguity between seeing with third person eyes and hearing with first person ears. What is Ada's dilemma here? Again, her husband is also nearly perfect, charming, devoted, doting but he's not the real breadwinner in their home. And he often laments that fact. He doesn't earn what he's capable of earning and he cannot fend off outside threats, um, you know, for, even from his own family. Ada is willing, she says in this clip, to destroy her marriage because Nduka is not that kind of a breadwinner. Um, I call what's going on in both of these films a kind of feminine melodramatic mode of address. Uh, the central concern of this mode is what kind of conjugal relationship would signal that families have access to or are part of the liberal world order. This is not a representation of the desires of actual women in Nigeria, I don't think, um, at least not necessarily, um, but it's a mode of addressing spectators' desires to live in an economy and to live in a country that would actually produce breadwinners, whether or not most real women in southern Nigeria would like to marry women. Right, so this desire for a certain kind of romantic and family relationship, I'm trying to argue, is actually a desire um, um, for a different kind of economic system. And I don't think I'm alone in making those kinds of arguments about um, Nollywood. I would point to Jane Bryce, especially, as making some very, you know, um, significant arguments about the relationship between sort of, you know, films about conjugal life and romance and big um, anxieties about the social and economic system uh, in which those families are organized. All right, I'm gonna move on to another quick clip um, and I won't play too many, I don't think I'm gonna play any more actual, you know, audio, video, visual clips, um, you know, so that, um, so if they're not working that this isn't uh, too big of a hurdle. Andy, 
Now, by the way, one of the things I have attempted to do in the, the book is to, um, you know, describe these kinds of scenes, you know, in text um, and to really try and bring the reader into it, you know, sometimes shot by shot so that you can really see exactly how the audiovisual nature of the scene is constructed. Um, in this one, you know, Andy first has a sort of flashback, the camera zooms onto his head, it dissolves, you know, the image dissolves, we see things that have happened previously. Um, you know, many of us know the plot of this film, but Andy, you know, um, has been drawn into what we call a money magic cult. You know, he's been he's been drawn into um, this group of men that um, tell him he can be unfathomably wealthy if he wants, but he must sacrifice the person he loves the most, which is his wife, Merit, you know, pictured here. Um, he tried to pass off a prostitute as his wife in a previous scene, um, but um, but the, the group figured it out. So he's been given this ultimatum. You must bring your wife or you will die. Um, that first flashback is again narrated sort of in a third person perspective. Yes, it's Andy's memories, but the camera, you know, very strictly speaking, the camera is showing Andy himself, right? Not, not showing the world through Andy's eyes. However, once uh, Merritt brings out that money, right? So that they're struggling financially. She's gone. Um, she's gotten money from her family. She's brought it back into the house. When she lays that money out uh, before Andy, then he suddenly remembers the ultimatum. Um, and the argument I want to make is that there's a very you know, close relationship between the money that Merritt brings into their house and then his remembering of the ultimatum and his choice at the end of this clip ultimately to follow through. And he does indeed take his wife to be sacrificed and he does indeed become unfathomably wealthy, although he's then haunted by her ghost you know, for the rest of the story. Um, you know, Andy's dilemma here is that, um, excuse me, is that he desperately wants to be a breadwinner in his house, right? And he says this at the beginning of the film in different ways. Um, that sometimes he says it very explicitly to Merritt um, and a woman that they call Auntie. You know, I want to repay you for all the things that you've done in this house. I want to be able to take you shopping. I want to be able to buy you things. Um, you know, Merritt, meanwhile, has a steady job as a secretary, and she is the one who's actually bringing a steady income into the home. But Andy desperately wants to be the breadwinner in his house. Um, when she brings that big stack of money into the home, it's as if it really exemplifies the fact that she is the actual breadwinner, right? So this is a kind of emasculation for Andy, I argue, um, you know, and what it does is then trigger his actual follow through with the sacrifice, right? That the fact that he's been emasculated by his wife being the breadwinner is what leads him to ultimately um, destroy her. Andy's story becomes a motif in Nollywood. It appears in different films, such as Ashes to Ashes, which is a vigilante film from 2001, and Billionaire's Club, another sort of money magic cult film from 2003. And the story is always the same. A man destroys the person for whom he would win bread in order to become a breadwinner. In each case, they desperately want to be the breadwinners in their homes. He's then haunted by her, and he seeks a way out. The solution that these men find tend to be in the institutions like the church and the state, which ironically are the primary conduits of breadwinner ideology in Nigeria, at least historically. Living in bondage, therefore, doesn't only ex um, explore the same ideological problems as the feminine melodramatic mode, but it, it actually responds to the feminine melodramatic mode. That's um, the argument that I make. And so here's just a couple of images to sort of um, illustrate why I would say that, you know, Living in Bondage came out at the same time that Checkmate was on television in Nigeria and as it was, you know, this very popular soap opera and many of the same actors uh, featured in both Checkmate and Living in Bondage. And they featured as very, very similar characters. So you can see, um, you know, I'm just going to let a few of them flash by you here, but you can see um, the similarities, right? This one is Checkmate on the left and Living in Bondage on the right in each case. In this case, it's not the same actor, but it's very much of the same kind of character, right? The, the same kind of character created, um, you know, um, uh, a polygamous family, the man at the center of a polygamous family and checkmate is sort of reused um, 
in living in bondage, a man at the center of a very similar kind of polygamous family. Um, and he is the kind of, you know, leader of, or, you know, one of the, the um, primary members of the money magic cult. Um, the, you know, what I'm saying is that this, if checkmate exemplifies the feminine melodramatic mode of address where spectators are sort of I, invited to identify with a feminine figure, you know, any kind of spectator is uh, invited to identify with a feminine figure as she sort of tries to understand how she could possibly be related to this set of economic and social and political possibilities that I'm calling liberalism, um, but can't quite have them, right? She's kind of held at arm's length from them. Um, the films like Living in Bondage respond and they constitute what I'm calling a masculine melodramatic mode of address. That is, you know, a melodramatic mode of address in which spectators are invited to identify with and see the world through these masculine uh, characters like Andy. The central message um, of the feminine mode might be that women must endure suffering because they don't have access to breadwinners. Uh, meanwhile, the masculine mode suggests that men who try to become breadwinners will also suffer. Nollywood explores the possibility that perhaps there's something diabolical about breadwinner ideolo ideology, which I think is certainly suggestive. However, instead of challenging the idea of the masculine mode also seems to suggest that men must wait, must labor and endure until such time as they too can gain access to the kind of liberal capitalist framework that could fulfill their desires. But I'll leave that there and perhaps we can come back to it. I just wanna quickly address you know, two other modes of address um, that you know, feature in the book. The next is the one that I call the Gothic mode of address. And I use the term Gothic to explain films that you know, are otherwise referred to as epics in Nollywood. Um, so again, many of us may know these films that are set in some version of the pre-colonial past, whether historical or mythical. Gothic, I think, is useful for describing the mode of address in these films because they invite spectators to identify with characters and communities who are haunted by the past. They explore terrains littered with the ruins of societies that in many cases never were. But these explorations also allow spectators to fantasize about a certain kind of liberal desire. In this case, it's the desire for political sovereignty. Um, just to illustrate this a little bit visually, um, here are three films uh, or you know, three screen media texts that where um, the actor Pete Edocie um, is a central character. Uh, we move here from the NTA, that is the you know, television um, adaptation of Things Fall Apart, of Chinua Achebe's Things Fall Apart, you know, to Igodo, Land of the Living Dead, an Hollywood movie from 1999, and um, An Egg of Life, which is very much like um, uh, Igodo, a very, very similar film. Um, and these, in these texts, you know, this uh, gothic mode of address invites spectators to identify with a kind of sovereign individual, often played by Pete Edocie, who embodies the struggles, or embodies the struggle to endure the relationship between internal and external power. The NTA adaptation of Things Fall Apart with Jared in 1986 took a Chebe's story of a community that was robbed of its chance to explore the limits of its own sovereignty and inflated that story into a hagiography of a martyred uh, sovereign. Uh, it sublimated Achebe's investment in Igbo republicanism and elevated Okonkwo to a near sovereign figure of power. Nollywood films further elevated a doche style characters into actual sovereigns, often called Igwe's. Um, you can see in the progression of these images, it sort of goes from, um, you know, Okonkwo, the character we all know, to a doche as a DBI. I know that's hard to see in the, in the second one, to um, a doche as an Igwe. The office of Igwe or king is in fact rare in the Southern Nigerian historical record, but it's incredibly common in Nollywood. Nearly every epic has to have an Igwe. Over and over, therefore, Nollywood epics seem to be grappling by sort of Gothic means with the recurring ghost of political sovereignty and the fantasy of living in its sinister world. Of course, full sovereignty is not really possible in the liberal order because all economies are dependent on capital flows, but in Nollywood epics, it seems as if this kind of sovereignty might just be. Um, lastly, the, you know, the, the final mode of address I explore in the book is a comic mode of address. And the, you know, the specific uh, inroad I use to, to look at that mode of address um, works, uh, um, <clears throat> the way I do it is by looking at mirrors, okay? And, and um, I have some sort of just sort of, you know, GIF images that can play over and over here. Um, and we'll see if they come through um, where you guys are watching it. But uh, the images here begin with Bassey and Company, which is a sitcom that aired on the NTA from 1986 to 1990. 
And in it, um, you know, uh, there is the strategic use of a mirror in many scenes. I hope you can see it there. It's in Madame the Madame's apartment. Um, it's situated directly across from a television screen. And it kind of makes this equation between a mirror as a kind of technology of subjectivity in a way that's very similar to the television screen. And then mirrors became, you know, pretty common features of screen media comedies when, um, when Nollywood came on the scene. In each of the examples you see here, mirrors make possible a different kind of free indirect subjectivity from that which I have otherwise explored. Rather than providing access to a particular character's subjectivity, however fleeting, mirrors can serve as a kind of secondary narrator, I argue, quite prosaically providing a different perspective on the action of the story. Each of the examples here also explores the nature and the limits of fraud. Bassey was famous for his tricks, if you ever saw that show, um, just like O Sophia, if you know this sort of very, you know, um, uh, important Nollywood movie called O Sophia in London. And then in the film pictured at the bottom, Nkemo Wo, the same actor who plays O Sophia, um, plays a 419er who, while inviting spectators to laugh, it's a comedy after all, he also shows them um, that what we know to be fraud is mirrored in the supposedly formal legal economy. He has this message at the end of the film, it's very populist. But in the end, it gained, and in the end, it gains very little traction in the world of the film, but it leaves the lasting impression that if the liberal world order sustains itself by holding Nigerians at arm's length, then there may be nothing wrong with cutting off that arm if necessary, right? That's the kind of message that this, uh, you know, satirical comedy and its use of mirrors leaves at the end of the day. All right, those, those are the, you know, major chapters of the book. Those are the kinds of modes of address I'm looking at. And I hope you've gotten a taste from these examples of, you know, how I work with them and, and what they look like. It, it's, again, really important to, to, to deal with the actual audio, visual, formal um, features of Nollywood films. Um, and to do that in a book, you know, as I said, I spend a lot of time trying to explain those scenes really well. Um, but it's always great to be able to see them when possible. So I'll conclude now. Uh, in this book, I framed several Nollywood films and television programs in terms of the way they participate in a certain version of the global political economy, which is, this is, of course, not the only way to think about Nollywood. Nevertheless, I feel that the study of Nollywood needs more extended, closely read, and historicized attempts. And by extended, I mean, you know, a book-length projects to really dig deep into and historicize um, uh, the industry and attempt to theorize it, to theorize it deeply and the kind of work that Nollywood performs for various constituencies. There are many aspects of the industry and uh, things about how it works and who propels it that we still need to study. Um, but I think without theories of Nollywood to be built upon, to contest, to break down and remake, I worry that the industry will remain some kind of you know, curiosity. Oh, how does Nollywood work? How do they make movies over there? Uh, personally, I would rather treat Nollywood as the massive powerhouse of science systems that it is, and then attempt to understand how it works in relationship to other science systems. My analysis will certainly never be the last word on the subject. Indeed, if you find my attempts unsatisfying, then I beg you to take up the call to better theorize and to better understand the world that Nollywood participates in creating and how it does so. I think Nollywood deserves it. So thank you very much for your attention, um, especially your patience. Um, through all the technical difficulties that I had. Um, I hope things are still working at least relatively well, um, and we'll do our best now to try and move on to um, having a conversation. I'd love to hear what your thoughts are and address any questions that you might have about Nollywood. And so again, it'll be a little tricky. I'll try to keep my eyes both on what I'm doing as well as what you guys are doing on YouTube. Thanks. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, and thank you, Matt, uh, for solving that problem. I know it's uh, quite tricky to be the re uh, recipient of that moment and then also be the one to solve the problem. So thank you and thanks to the audience for your patience. It was actually quite uh, helpful to know that many people were interested and engaged. I went on uh, YouTube to check and I realized that people were really eager to listen. So thank you. And um, so uh, we'll go to Q&A. Um, we uh, we had a, have a lot to to think through in some of these um, ideas that you've shared with us, and I think that people are taking time to digest. I've seen a couple of questions, and uh, if I may, I'll just quickly ask one of them, uh, just so I don't uh, start by asking mine. And I have a couple myself, but I'll start with this one. It's from. Uh, 
uh, I believe uh, Pelumi or Lajimi, for Lajimi, yes. And essentially it's something that you said, and I guess that his own way of responding to it is whether you actually want to explain how a commercial video industry, just as Nigeria, can uh, sort of work with uh, the mode of the television station, which is more public, and like, especially given the history of uh, NTV, uh, as you said, was actually uh, generated or developed to address a public in a non-commercial mode, some kind of ideological or what you call ped pedagogical kind of mode that the uh, ruling party in Western Nigeria, the action group uh, put in, 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 in motion in 1959. So is there something that you want to respond to uh, in terms of how you, you see the relationship between the uh, screen media system, that is television, uh, state television, and um, uh, and uh, Nollywood, what later became Nollywood, that is commercial video. Right. Yep. Um, you know, um, from what I can also see uh, there on YouTube, um, you know, Pelumi, you know, raises a very important point, which is, um, so uh, I think it's true that, you know, the that state television and, and Nollywood are, are different, you know, are very different things. Although, um, you know, um, although in some ways the, the amount of difference is perhaps a construction of my own to some degree, right? But, um, but the question that he seems to be asking is is a very you know sort of more structural and and real issue, which is that you know if television um, constitutes you know um, its audiences in a kind of live way, um, all the audience at a particular time. If you're not there at that time, you're not part of the audience. Versus video films, where you watch when you want to watch and. The, the screen constitutes its audience, maybe just in you know one living room. Um, you know, does this matter for the analysis? And I think it's clear that the two things are different, and I would say they they certainly do matter. Um, you know, um, and I guess that's another way of saying just how different these two media are. Um, but at the end of the day, the the way I see it, the way you know I've been thinking about it during the time writing the book, is that precisely because these are so very different. Why would they nevertheless use these similar modes of address? Why would they still conceptualize their audiences as similar, knowing how, in fact, different the audiences might or could be? Um, and you know, it's when I was seeing these similarities that I had to ask myself, you know, um, you know, what's going on in Nollywood, especially what is it going on in Nollywood that it would, um, you know, have these messages about patience, about waiting for your opportunity, about abiding, you know, uh, in your situation before you can have access to the good life, you know, before you can have access to these things that seem to be a product of a certain political economy. Um, you know, so I acknowledge the importance of um, Pelumi's, you know, question. Um, you know, I think it, at the end of the day, then it was the, the book's purpose was to try and answer that question, that a similar question, you know, or, or um, related set of questions by saying, um, even if they are constituted in these different ways, both screen media seem to be saying that Nigerians, you live in here and you're going to have to wait to get at least some piece of what's out there. And I'm not saying that, again, this is how life actually works in Nigeria. This is how screen media are constituting, you know, a set of sign systems about how life might work. And it's a set of sign systems that's just remarkably similar to what um, state television had to say. So, I, you know, I hope that addresses that distinction that he's identified at least somewhat. Okay, all right. Um, so uh, there's a, a question uh, from uh, Joya uh, Razi, which is somewhat close, uh, but also different. And uh, the question is, what do you think is the connection uh, between what you call indirect, uh, between indirect subjectivity and the ability or inability of audience members to return the gaze of the, of the camera? Yeah, um, you know, this is a really important question, again, about whether or not just because um, screen media say something, uh, do audiences hear what, uh, what they have said? Do they all hear it the same way? Um, do they, you know, um, and I'm being metaphorical here, you know, do they hear, do they see, do they understand, do they have their own input, as she's suggesting, you know, do they resist or rework those messages and those images in their own ways? Certainly they do. Um, 
And I, you know, I address in the introduction to the book, the fact that, you know, as a scholar trained in literary studies and someone who spent, yes, lots of time immersed in, you know, the world of Nollywood and, and um, you know, Nigeria, Southern Nigeria and popular culture and so on. Um, nevertheless, um, I, I don't really do audience analysis research. Um, you know, and so perhaps it's sidestepping the issue, but I think one important way of thinking through this um, is actually a sort of cultural studies framework for, for thinking about texts like this. But it's that, um, is that while we know audiences have all kinds of power and agency to reconstitute and reconfigure um, images um, and messages that they receive, at the same time, uh, I think it's really important to acknowledge the, the vast amount of power that um, audiovisual industries have for putting those messages out in the first place, right? There's no message for the audience to respond to unless it's been put out in the first place. And that's a massive amount of power. Um, you know, the way we often think about it is that um, these images, these sounds, um, they are part of a language, you know, they're part of a sign system. And languages and sign systems constitute our realities, no matter where we are. Um, right, the languages that we use to speak, the English that I'm speaking now, um, comes with all kinds of predetermined features to it. So yes, I can say anything, I can use it in lots of different ways, but I can't change, in some cases, many of the actual signs that I'm using to communicate with. And I think that screen media industries um, similarly constitute a set of signs, put them into play, that, um, that then we end up using, that audiences end up using, um, and even though they may use them in different ways, they have to use the signs that are sort of provided, right? They, that the, you know, the way that cultural studies scholars like Stuart Hall have framed this is that, um, you know, media images constitute our realities, right? That there's, there's in some sense no reality except that reality that we access through various kinds of signs and sign systems, or at least there's no reality that has any meaning to us. Um, and, and so it's, it's that way of putting into play the very signs that will shape our reality or shape the way that we derive meaning from our reality that I'm trying to deal with here. The, you know, Nollywood, state television, colonial cinema, they have put these certain things into play. Um, and, and even if audiences can reconstitute them in certain ways, um, it's really important to deal with the, you know, the, the initial power that those screen media industries have of determining the sign systems that, that we're going to end up using. So that's how I would respond to that question. Okay. All right. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, there's a, a question from Medchev, uh, and I actually have something related. So uh, I'll ask this question and maybe find a way of roping mine in. I hope uh, it works. But if not, I'll ask it separately. So the question is whether you can, uh, uh, could you elaborate on the divergence or convergence? Uh, if any, that is, between peri-liberalism and the informal system. So it's a straightforward question. And my own, which I'll just ask and uh, talk to you whether you want to answer them separately or build them together is, uh, I actually don't quite understand the distinction you made between peri-liberalism and what uh, dependency theorists uh, tried to characterize as peripherality. Mm -hmm. peripherality. Yeah. And you said that it's different. And uh, I mean, even reading the book, the way you try to sort of talk about how the classic Marxist from Leo Trotsky, a conception of uh, uneven and combined, combined mm -hmm. and uneven development, that it's always been there. You know, this right. question of the relation between the metropole or the center and the periphery. And so what, how do you make that distinction? If you can just maybe for my own purpose, uh, on, uh, explain that. And so I don't know, these are perhaps two different questions, but if you want to take them together, that would be helpful too. Yeah. You know, I struggled with this um, in some ways. Um, you know, I think that the, you know, de dependency theorists had very important points to make. And I want to, you know, just, um, you know, modify slightly, you know, add to slightly and complicate slightly. And so in trying to figure out a language to say it, um, you know, that that peri in peri-liberalism, you know, kept coming back. Is it the same peri and peripheral? Obviously it, it is, you know, but at the same time, I like the idea of emphasizing um, or using as an analogy, the idea of peri-urban spaces. I mean, yes, we're, I'm trying to talk about a center 
and something outside of it. I, I, again, this is liberalism was always constructed this way. It always had some kind. It always had recourse to some kind of outside that could justify <laughs> not only the economic system, uh, but as I tried to explain, you know, I, I didn't dwell on much today in the presentation, but in the book, you know, the conceptual, the theoretical, the, the political ideas of, you know, um, we can't, you know, um, conceptualize individual rights, you know, um, and, you know, some of the, the pillars of, of liberal philosophy. Um, I'm, I'm sort of um, paraphrasing the architects of that philosophy when I say we. Um, so I, I'm saying that, you know, that um, the liberal philosophy has always had in it this sense that, you know, we can't actually conceptualize the things that matter to us unless we have foils, you know, we have outsides, we have places that they don't apply, mm -hmm. that, you know, that can help us think through them. Again, this isn't new thinking either. Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, what I wanted to bring together in these is to suggest that um, this need to have an outside is so central to liberal philosophy, is so, you know, so important um, that it can't exist without it, which means that the outside is actually central, you know, is actually the inside. Um, and, you know, yes, I understand that that's an abstract thing and not necessarily easy to think through, but I think it's an important thing to just continue to hold um, in our minds. It's not simply the case that the periphery is dependent on the center. The center, you know, is absolutely dependent on the periphery. It could never have existed without the periphery. Um, and the center knows that and the periphery knows that. And yet there's this perpetual idea that yet the periphery is outside, you know, and screen media seem to situate themselves between the two. They seem to be, like I said, constructing this reality, this set of sign systems that perpetuate this idea that they're actually, you know, different, that one's actually outside of the other, when, again, we could never have had the modern world that we have um, without those so-called peripheries being absolutely central to all those processes. So yeah. in the same there's no such thing as a city without its peri-urban zones, mm -hmm. without peri-liberalism. Yeah, so it's actually an idea that goes all the way back to uh, to Hegel, you know, the old classic of lordship and bondage, the, mm -hmm. the relationship between, I mean, the old idea of the specular relations, uh, you are able to maintain a certain kind of power to the extent that there is a presence or another entity on, on, on which to display that power. And without that entity, then your ability to even constitute your subjectivity does not, does not exist, you know? So, but of course, the, the way classic Marxist theories have taken, it's quite, quite different in, in it's, uh, it's deeper in economic terms, but right. I think it's essentially perhaps the, the same kind of uh, configuration, uh, but, I don't know that it's exactly the question that Merchev was asking, okay. uh, especially in relationship to informal system, whether yeah. very liberalism is the same thing, or if there's a convergence or, or divergence between that and what we've come to call uh, uh, the informal system in okay. economic terms. Um, you know, certainly I think so. Um, you know, I can't say that this is elaborated, you know, much at all in the book. So. I'm thinking through it now, but, you know, absolutely, um, you know, it's precisely because of not having direct access to formal capital investments and all of the things that go with it that necessitates an informal economic system. Um, and it's not simply a different, you know, economic system. It's not simply just, uh, you know, another way of operating, you know, um, it's, you know, that informality is directly related once again to the formality of the, um, mm -hmm. of the liberal capitalist system, right? They, it, they do kind of, re they produce one another in a sense. So it's, it's not simply that, oh, there's, a, there's just a way that people can, um, you know, make their lives without capitalism and it looks like this. It's that the, the version of the way that people make their lives um, without capitalism is a direct result of them not having access to the capitalism that otherwise you know, surrounds them. So I do see them as sort of constituting each other in that same way, if that makes sense. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, thank you. Uh, there, is another, there are other questions, actually. There's one from uh, Esther, that's Esther De Bruyne, and thanking you for, uh, for the presentation and saying, looking forward to reading, you know, how you dig into these rich archives as you're reading the book. Uh, and the question, of course, that she has for you is, uh, what ways, in what ways is the feminine, what they call the feminine masculine mode of address, uh, melodramatic, uh, whether that 
uh, term is that that word melodramatic is, is important. How is it important to your mm -hmm. question? So that's one from her. Mm -hmm. And just to let you know that there are more, there's another question from uh, Muradeo Mwadejumoki, uh, uh, skin. The, perhaps this is perhaps outside the scope of your research, but whether you can think of other instances of free indirect subjectivity in other African stream media uh, outside Nollywood. And uh, the reason you ask this question is to get a sense of how widely the framing might apply to African, African stream media in general. Okay. So those two, yes, if you want to take those, okay. thank you. Um, so to begin with, you know, the question of melodrama, um, I could go on and on and it's a very, you know, pet subject, but I, I'll try to, you know, be very, very brief. Um, I rely a lot on theories of melodrama derived from Peter Brooks and, and many of us who kind of tinker around Nollywood studies, you know, have the, have this used the same kind of archive of melodrama theory. I think it, you know, makes sense that way that we're, we're talking to each other. Um, and so, you know, Peter Brooks, you know, is a, is, is a seminal theorist of, of melodrama writing about, you know, um, print literature, um, you know, but his argument is that, you know, um, melodrama isn't simply, you know, over the top, you know, st storytelling or something like that. Um, it's a particular mode of storytelling that um, was necessitated in the modern world precisely because um, all societies in the modern world have lost some kind of bearing in terms of adjudicating morality, you know, and the, his way of thinking about it in, in France, you know, um, in the 19th century is that, you know, um, is that the, the church and the state, you know, became fractured, um, you know, with the loss of the monarchy, you know, and so on during the French Revolution. And now there's at least two, if not more sort of you know, systems of um, adjudicating morality. And in this kind of world, you know, created by modernity, um, people are looking for ways of, you know, uh, rethinking morality, of coming up with new ideas about what is moral and what isn't. Um, and so melodrama is a mode that helps precisely because it sort of raises the stakes of what is good and what is bad in most stories. In some cases, yes, in this sort of over the top sort of storytelling way, but but that's less important than the fact that it, it, it sort of identifies a world and then digs below the surface of that world to mine what might be truly good and what might be truly bad. Um, Peter Brooks calls this the moral occult, this realm underneath the surface of reality where new ideas about morality could be found. Um, and so while I am dealing certainly with like soap operas and soap opera style um, you know, films, and in the book, I try to, you know, trace some genealogy, even of that term soap opera and so on. I think what matters for now is the idea that, um, you know, in both the feminine melodramatic mode of address and the masculine melodramatic mode of address, um, you know, they're, they're inviting us, they're inviting spectators to identify with some construction that we could call feminine and some construction that we call masculine. Um, but in both cases, they're trying to sort of dig below the surface of these families and these relationships and uncover what is the truly moral choice, um, right? So, you know, if your husband's not a breadwinner, what do you do? Or if you as a man cannot be a breadwinner, what do you do? Um, you know, and like I said, these are indirect subjects of these texts. These movies aren't only about breadwinners, but this really important indirect subject features in both of these um, kinds of screen media. And, and they're melodramatic in the sense that they're trying to, you know, um, isolate and identify and then amplify and sort through um, what is the moral choice in these different um, contexts. Uh, for, on the second question about whether or not free and direct subjectivity could be used to study other forms of African screen media, um, I think absolutely. Um, I'm trying to think if I have a, an example to, and nothing's coming to mind right away, but. But generally speaking, here's what I think is useful about using free and direct subjectivity as a, as a method, as a reading method, is that, um, is that, you know, once you begin looking for it, you notice these moments where it's ambiguous, you know, um, whose perspective is, uh, is being displayed, you know, or whose perspective um, the audience is being invited to identify with. Um, but it's certainly fractures the kind of, you know, um, straightforward 
third person way of seeing the world that the text has given us and leaves the audience a little bit unsettled, or at least, you know, could it sort of unsettles the spectator to think, you know, oh yeah, I'm actually, you know, getting a little bit of so-and-so's perspective here. And, and it begins, you know, when, when you see patterns where that, um, where that convention is inviting you to identify with certain characters over and over again, more than other characters, you might think this particular screen media really sort of wants us to think about the world from, from their point of view, or really wants us to identify with the issues that, that they're facing more than anyone else. And if so, what's at stake in that? Why, why is the screen media text here so uh, invested in this particular character's experience of the world? Um, and so then I, I think, you know, um, Again, these aren't these aren't the big, obvious, clear choices that the filmmakers have said to the audience. Here's how I want you to know my film. These are, you know, critical interpretive frameworks, but they're ways of sort of getting at the edges and the silences and underneath and around some of the things that are going on in text to see what other ways they're inviting us to, to know and think about what's going on. That's why I call the topics that they raise indirect subjects from the direct subject of the text. But I think these indirect subjects can lead to even deeper and more nuanced and more interesting, you know, theories about what the text is trying to say and what matters to it. And there may be cases where the filmmakers are very aware of how they're inviting uh, audiences to identify. There may be places where that, you know, it was unintentional. But the fact of the matter is that the text exists now and it is talking to audiences. Mm -hmm. Regardless of what the filmmaker intended, um, we should be open to some of the things that the text might be saying to audiences that aren't obvious, you know, and this is one way of getting at some of them. Yeah, there's actually, I'm, I mean, while listening to these and also reading uh, your book, actually, uh, my mind went back to uh, an addressive mode in photo plays, which were based on comics. Sure. And really, they often use thought bubbles. So, uh, you know, so, I mean, I don't know whether it's exactly the same thing, but it's actually a way of articulating a perspective that is neither available to another uh, member, on the, you know, to another character on the screen or on the page at that moment, for which this particular character is, uh, has, you know, so, and sometimes in fact, they use what we might call some kind of soliloquy, but it's kind of different. And the way it was represented in text, in uh in photo play was essentially through thought bubbles and perhaps it's a similar kind of uh, uh, practice. And, uh, and I've actually got a, some kind of feeling that perhaps that's where now they began to develop that, this, this mode of address. Yeah, sure. Yeah, you know, when we talk about free and direct discourse in literature, you know, we talk about those moments in the text where there aren't quotation marks, you know, it's not clear that the character is speaking and yet it's as if the character suddenly takes over the job of, of the narrator. And yeah. so it's interesting and similarly in any kind of text to think about at what point does it, this same sort of taking over or this ambiguity seem to happen where it's, where you're not sure, is there two people narrating the text at this moment? Is it a jumping back and forth? Is it, a, you know, it's that freeness of it and the indirection. Um, that can open up space to think about what does it, that text think about its audience and what does that text want its audience to, to experience in this particular moment. Okay. All right. Um, looking for more questions. So uh, none is coming for now and we have a few minutes. So I want to actually ask this question too, which uh, came out. I think I saw it in a fairly long footnote <laughs> in the book. It's something that's always been part of uh, Nollywood uh, criticism. This is the question of the relationship between what we call the South and Nigeria, and that's the focus of your own research. Yeah. And of course, Kanyewood. Mm -hmm. And the way it's often presented is that the mode of address in Kanyewood is different and perhaps, perhaps not always helpful to think of um, both of them, both formations uh, as one, uh, or what we might call monolithic. But at the same time, and that, uh, this is the, the point I'm trying to raise that now, since you, the, the kind of theoretical um, idea that organizes, or even political idea that organizes your discussion, especially through indirect rule, which actually was uniformly applied with, with of course, uh, frictions within Nigeria. Yeah. So with that kind of grid, with that kind of political grid coming from uh, Lord Lugard, who actually first did it in the North. So is there a way that even with the former uh, commercial or structural differences between Carnywood and Nollywood? Is there a way to actually begin to think of these as Nigerian forms and thereby think of, yeah, 
while allowing those distinctions, but also be able to think of them in a more uh, integral manner uh, because Nigeria exists with all the problems that we have and all of that. So I wanted to hear your response to that. Yeah, it's a, you know such an important question. Um, I mean, the, the part that you know and, and others you know here will, will know too is, is that um, you know, sometimes we make the analogy to India. Um, one way we could say it is that there really are multiple film industries in Nigeria. And there's this question of does Nollywood apply to all of them or only the English language, you know, industry in the South? Um, and it's an unresolved question, but one that we each sort of, you know, situate ourselves in somehow before moving forward with work um, that we do. Uh, in this case, yes, I've gone forward with the idea that I'm restricting myself to those, you know, English, mostly English language films um, from Southern Nigeria that sort of have this relationship to state television, especially English language state television, and not all state television was in English, but a lot of it was, um, especially those big, you know, national broadcasts. Um, and, and thinking about what that very, like, globally oriented version of, you know, Nigerian filmmaking, you know, thinks about the world. Um, when it comes to, you know, Northern Nigerian films, I mean, there's the practical issue of how many of them more and more they're subtitled, but in the, you know, old days they weren't necessarily. And if you don't have access to a lot of Hausa, um, you know, sort of working with them, um, <clears throat> there is, you know, the fact that, that aesthetically they have their own conventions. They're very different from Southern Nigerian films and so on. But I think you're absolutely correct in the sense that, um, there's, there is an, absolutely a um, conceptualization of what it means to be a Nigerian going on in those movies and a Nigerian in relationship to the rest of the world. What I think is potentially really stimulating about a research agenda that would, that would probe that, you know, more fully um, and that I'm not sure I'm necessarily placed to do, but possibly, but I know, you know, many people who are, you know, such as Carmen McCain, um, although I don't think she would have the same interest, the same theoretical interest, but nevertheless, what, what I'm getting at is, um, is that I, I would doubt that if you looked very closely at a lot of those films, th that the orientation to sort of liberal capitalism is the same. I, you know, I don't th think so, right? So this would really complicate, you know, there's a sense in which perhaps Southern Nigeria looks out to the world in a particular way um, versus the way that Northern Nigeria looks out to the world. Um, you know, especially with Northern Nigeria's interest in, you know, Bollywood film conventions, um, but also just, you know, its interest in other centers of capitalism in the world. It's, um, you know, other centers like Dubai or, um, you know, in Saudi Arabia or something like that. There's a way that, um, that both film industries, and I, I think they're different industries, but they're part of the same massive cultural complex, you know, national cultural complex. Um, and they're looking out into the world and sort of um, processing it in different ways. And I don't know, I don't have any more sort of specifics, I think, to lend to the to thinking about how I, how House of Language films may be processing that sense of the world. Um, but I think it would be somewhat different from, and perhaps even more complex than the way I have characterized, you know, the Southern Nigerian film industry's conception of the world. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a very important distinction and it's really very, I mean, of course, <laughs> it's also built on the way Nigeria is, in fact, you know, right. with all the fi fictions and frictions mm -hmm. on, the, on the political front. So it's actually quite a legitimate distinction to make. Yeah. And, uh, so thank you. Uh, we are, actually at the end of our time and uh, also uh, as it turns out not many questions are coming anymore so i think ideally this would be the time to give uh, you a break and thank you again for presenting this is very very stimulating work it's very important work and as i said when you and i were sort of chatting up at the beginning i really really hope that this book that a book that people would take very seriously because it's a very serious book and thank you for doing it and thanks for advising and uh, advancing uh, our discourse in very serious in a very serious manner so uh enjoy the rest of your day and uh next time you will be able to do this without uh, any kind of glitch uh from a technological yeah. point of view so thank you matt and thank you audience for your attention and for your support and um, we'll see you next month uh have a good weekend thank you bye bye thank you everyone and thank you for bearing with me have a great day okay